Gaida, Nicholas, Matt. Get the what? Sorry, Monica. The run of show. I sent it via email. Yes. Yep. Cool. Thank you. And I just got the pop up. We're live now, right, Monica? Yeah, we're live. Okay, perfect. All right, give me one second. All right, there we go. So I guess, uh, Monica, I'll start with, because now I'm seeing a bunch of people log in. So I'll start with like a brief intro as we get started. Okay. And then I'll pass it over to you. Cool. So um, thank you, everybody, for logging in today. Um, we have a discussion with some of our local startup founders. Uh, my name is Nikki Caboos. I'm the VP of Development with Palm Beach Tech. Um, and just to give anybody a brief overview that is not really too familiar with Palm Beach Tech about what we do, uh, basically we are a local Palm Beach County uh, tech nonprofit. Um, we actually just announced uh, just under a month ago that we're actually going to be expanding to become a regional South Florida organization. And um, our whole goal and mission is to build South Florida into a tech hub. And um, we do that by connecting with local companies, startups, our colleges, universities, coding companies, and really just building the community here, bringing people together, um, helping by um, offering resources, upskilling. So we do everything from panel discussions to technical workshops and everything in between. So, um, oh, sorry for the dog. Um, <laughs> I want to go ahead and pass it off to Monica. She's actually our member engagement specialist at Palm Beach Tech, and she's actually gonna be moderating this uh, panel today. Um, she actually had her own startup, so we thought she would be perfect to do this with. But if you want to take it over, Monica. Sure. Um, thank you. So like she said, I'm the member engagement specialist at Palm Beach Tech. Um, I had my own startup a few months ago. I was in the Tech Runway program. I know Matt, he's a part of it. And I know Nick and Gaida just because they're part of the 1909 community. Uh, the great thing about you know South Florida is we're still small. And as we continue to grow, you know, all these familiar faces become teammates as we build our community. So I'm going to start off just by introducing everybody. Um, I'll start off with Gaida, and she's actually the co-founder of Sustainabase, and she's a veteran of the legal technology, green building, and sustainability industry with over two decades of experience. Um, Gaida, you could definitely go into more detail throughout um, the community coffee. And um, just wanted to share that she was recognized as um, a super lawyer and member of Florida's Trend Legal Elite and a South Florida Legal gu Guide professional. And next, I'm going to introduce Matt. He's a co-founder co of Get Speedback, and they're a platform that enables businesses to conduct simple, continuous employee performance reviews through the years without any additional work. Um, and Matt was recently invited into the FAU Tech Runway Accelerator Program. Congrats again. And I believe you guys were founded in 2020, right, Matt? Yep, January. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And Nick, so he was raised in Hawaii, which I thought that was super cool. And he's a tech entrepreneur who's passionate and creative, who is also building uh, the future of work with his startup called Bundle IQ. And he's also an active member of the board of 1909. And he's just the type of person you want to be around. He's a leader. And he's super passionate about innovation. So, you know, I briefly int um, introduced you guys. You guys can go ahead and take over and kind of chat more about, you know, what you guys do and how it's like to be a start founder here in South Florida. Great. Thank you for that intro. Yeah. So do you want, kind of, do you want to introduce yourself? I mean, I, I kind of just did a brief um, introduction, but tell us a little bit more about Sustainabase. Sure. Um, yeah, well, you mentioned my, my backgrounds in law. I was a partner at a big law firm and then um, decided that um, there was an industry, which is in sustainability world and green building, that's uh, needed a lot of uh, modernizing um, that I was seeing in other industries. And so I was working with tech with a lot of SaaS type companies in other industries doing services and software. And I realized that in the sustainability world, um, regrettably, it's still really hard. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are not automated. Um, everything from making your builders green, greener, which you know buildings take up 
I won't go into percentages, but a large chunk of our energy use and our water use and emissions, et cetera. Um, and then everything from buildings to, you know, how do you do a sustainability plan or track your emissions, things like that. It's just really manual and hard. And so we decided we're going to try to, to make it better. That's what we're, what we're working on. Okay, that's so cool, yeah. Um, Matt, you I want can to jump in next? About, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. Uh, we'll keep the order going. Um, so my name is Matt Meadows um, from Get Speedback. Um, I had a background in some various other startups and then most recently a content marketing agency. And um, I was responsible for managing a team of 15 people and we would conduct employee performance reviews twice a year, uh, 360 review style. So it would take us basically two weeks every six months. And um, I thought that was a really big problem and it could be done a lot better. And I hooked up with my co-founder, my buddy Mihai, who's also watching live. Um, he has a, a corporate background as well. Um, and he saw the same sorts of issues. And so we basically kicked things off by just conducting interviews with various, various local companies here in South Florida to determine if this was enough of a problem that we should try to solve it. And um, after those meetings, we basically, <laughs> we found out that yes, everyone hates employee performance reviews for one reason or another, and we should, we should pursue it. So um, effectively since January, uh, we've been building the platform um, the platform is currently being tested by several local businesses, and we're actually working on making our first sale, hopefully this week or next week. Um, but as you mentioned as well, Monica, we're, we're participating um, FAU Tech Runway Venture Program, as well as 1909's internal uh, accelerator, and we're learning a ton from those experiences. So we're at the point basically where, where we're just looking to make the first sale and then um, grow from there um, and look look to build a, a sales process from that. Nice. Yeah, congrats on your almost first sale. That's like, yeah, thank you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Nick? Yeah, thanks for hosting us and congrats, Matt, on your first sale coming up soon. We're going to celebrate that in advance. <laughs> uh, so my background um, in 2006, when I came out of college, I, I started in media and advertising. I worked for Cox uh, in partnership with Yahoo and, and ended up selling a bunch of banner ads and kind of rolled out behavioral targeting and digital technologies and so across South, South Florida. Uh, and what I realized is that a lot of the agencies were pretty traditional down here. Um, and so I, I decided to leave the uh, Cox Media Company and started a digital agency. And, um, and that's kind of where I cut my teeth into um, full-time entrepreneurship when I was 25 and um, decided to, after meeting a few people, get into the app space and um, developed a few apps. Uh, we had some success in selling apps. Uh, the business model was a cost per download uh, business model. So the first app we developed was a, a turntable DJ app called Mixer. And it was the first like turntable DJ app on the iPad back in 2011. And then created a teleprompter app and then a surfing app and then decided to basically get away from that business model and, and try to um, kind of reach a, a much larger problem or solve a much larger problem in the knowledge management space. Um, going back to my, my agency days and really being obsessed with workflow and, and how uh, people organize and, and create knowledge um, and insights. Um, and I, I read a McKinsey study uh, a couple of years ago that said that about 60% of people's time during the work week is spent managing information and about 20% of people's time is spent searching for it. So um, I figured there's you know, a, a lot of room for improvement and leveraging artificial intelligence and the machines to basically help you organize and, right. and create knowledge. And so that's, uh, that's Bundle IQ. Um, that's why we exist at least. Yeah, wow. So you literally went from a you know, completely different industry to another one. So I feel like you've touched a lot of you know, different startups. So, I mean, like, we'll start off with you, Nick, like, what's your why? Like, what has kept you going, you know, here in South Florida? A lot of times we're tempted just to move out there to California or wherever there's venture capital. Like, why have you cho chosen to stay down here? And like, what's your why? Um, so 
I guess why for why bundle IQ exists is because I, I believe that we can do so much better um, and use our time so much more efficiently. Um, so my, my goal is to give people their time back so that we can start being more human, hum, more like humans and instead of like machines and let the machines do the, the heavy lifting on that side. Um, and then why South Florida, uh, it's not for any other reason except that the quality of life here is just better. And uh, it's just better. <laughs> like I've, I've, lived, I've lived in California. I, I moved out to Silicon Valley for several months and I've basically been bopping back and forth building relationships with the investors in the Bay Area um, for some time now. And, and it would be really tough to live out there. I mean, it's, it's kind of gloomy you know, it's 50 degrees kind of all on average all year round. It's, it's not an ideal place to live in my opinion. So especially someone coming for somebody coming from Hawaii and South Florida for yeah. half my life. Yeah. And Gata, what about you? I mean, what, what keeps you going? Like what's your why and you know, why have you seen South Florida as well? Yeah. Um, so we are, we're definitely more of a social entrepreneurial venture, right? So uh, a big why for us is empowering sustainability, you know, making it easy so that people out there on the ground really trying to do these good things have the right tools to do it. Um, and so big why is, you know, Florida has a lot of building, like big multifamily buildings. And, you know, when you know that by helping that one building be better, you're affecting the way that it's going to perform for like decades for hundreds of people that live there. I mean, that's a huge why, right? Or when you're helping a sustainability coordinator that's struggling to figure out, you know, my water use, my carbon, my electricity, et cetera. And like, how do I communicate that to people? And when you give them the tools to be able to like log in and just see that and be able to go beyond that and start creating strategy that moves the needle, that's the why, you know, that's huge. Is it easy though? No, <laughs> you have your days where, you know, it's really hard and you, you know, question what you're doing and which way it should go. And I mean, that's normal. It's like you have your, your startup or, you know, we're a part, part of our business is not a startup anymore than part of it is, right? So we have a kind of an ongoing established um, kind of building side of our business, but the technology of it is. And you're always thinking of ways of like, where's the right market fit for this? And how do we pivot to the right place? And, you know, there's a lot of excitement in that aspect of it. And there's also a lot of, you know, sleepless nights over that. And that's just how it is. And, you know, I don't know who all in this call is an entrepreneur or not, but if you are, you know what I'm talking about and you, you know, you, you're okay with that or you wouldn't be doing what you're doing, right? Um, and South Florida, I, I agree with Nick, it's, it's a great, place to be it's um the weather's great the people are great beyond that though it's incredible how many amazing connections and people are in Florida that are kind of under the radar and mm -hmm. I think that's great I mean you meet people that are doing big businesses in New York all over the Northeast people you know you, you meet really interesting people and and we're so long and diverse that you can find all different kinds of connections and people. Um, at, up to this point, I haven't had an issue finding talent. Um, I know some other companies I've talked to have, um, but uh, we like it. And, and for what we're doing, I feel like it's kind of ground zero for what we're doing and it's a, it's a good place to be doing it. Yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, to kind of touch about like the diversity that you mentioned, I just feel like South Florida, you know, they have people that are successful entrepreneurs that have retired and moved down here just to enjoy the beach. Then you have, you know, a lot of international uh, players who like South Florida because it's so diverse. And then you just have, you know, startup founders who like Nick, who like to go to the beach and just like the sun. And, you know, it's just, it's just really cool because I feel like once you really get involved in South Florida, you see the potential that it has. And, you know, this is just the beginning. So it's like, what's going to happen five years from now? Like, who are we going to be as a whole? Um, but anyways, Matt, so I kind of understand your why just because you've worked in the corporate world and your partner, Mihai, as well. Like, I mean, but what drives you internally? And again, like, why South Florida, why South Florida your home? Yeah, so the the business side of things, as you said, is sort of self-evident. Um, I, in particular, had... Uh, 
a couple um, experiences of some really poor corporate culture as well that I thought was would be really great if we could help negate that for you know anyone who's who's stuck in that situation and also the idea of being stuck in a job where there are no real prospects for growth. Um, so that's sort of, if we can solve that, that's sort of a, an inherent reward for us in building this business. Personally, and to be completely transparent, both Mihai and I have an internal drive to build something for ourselves. So we've worked in many other businesses, but we, we always felt this, this pull towards, yeah, we want to build something and hopefully we can, we can turn it into something really successful. Um, so I'm, I'm excited by that and, and by this first, you know, six, seven month foray into, into entrepreneurship. Um, and then from the standpoint of South Florida, it, it did just so happen to be that we, we were both here um, already. However, um, to echo the guide is the point about diversity. I would say uh, also adding the diversity of the industries here in South Florida has been very beneficial from our standpoint of we were trying to identify our initial target market to go after because basically every company looks to conduct reviews once you hit a specific size and you realize that it can be valuable from your employees or your employees would appreciate it. So how do we go about narrowing that down? Um, it, it's really been, been helpful once again, just to have all these different types of companies to speak to. And, you know, we, we've spoken with you know, large software companies, modernizing medicines in our, you know, backyard, Office Depot's corporate headquarters, digital marketing agencies, even healthcare companies. Um, so it, it's been really helpful from that standpoint. And at this time, especially since we're all remote, um, we, we can be anywhere we need to be. So it's, it's nice that we have, you know, these sorts of companies here. And if we, if we want to go reach out and, and meet with them in person, we can. But at this point, we're not really limited. Um, but on top of that, anyway, just, just the, from the standpoint of South Florida is really rallying together right now in terms of trying to grow the, the tech scene. And that, that all starts with what you guys are doing. And that has also helped us from the standpoint of people are much more open and willing to help us um, get started. So that's it's been a huge bonus um, being here in South Florida. Cool. So, I mean let's just talk about how you guys build your network. I mean, this could just be an open discussion, uh, Nick, Guida, Matt, like how would you recommend and suggest to all the startup founders listening? Like, how do you meet the right people? How do you put yourself in those shoes? Like, how do you approach um, everybody to, you know, get the most benefits for your startups? I'm happy to kick it off. Uh, so on the talent side, um, it's been interesting because the, the whole thing with COVID uh, really unlocked a lot of talent uh, in terms of like technology companies letting go of other companies. And so I, I, I reached out to um, the head of talent acquisition at Eventbrite after they let go of 12% of their workforce and kind of through that, through that, you know, network, I was able to kind of find some other people and then, and then I got on a text message thread with a few people and um, that helped out a lot. So um, LinkedIn has been helpful. And then on the VC front uh, for funding, Twitter is hands down the best. Um, so if you're looking for funding, Twitter, building relationships on Twitter is like unparalleled in my opinion. Um. I guess uh, as to finding talent uh, for me, I think uh, Palm Beach Tech and 1909 have been huge, um, not, not just for talent. Like I, I've, found, I've found people through, through just the resumes that people post and then also you know word of mouth, but from a personal standpoint, just being able to connect with other people nearby that are doing similar things. Um, I think your organization and 1909 have been incredibly helpful to us for that. Um, and, uh, and, and through those connections, you make other connections like, you know, the VMT and then organizations down South. And so um, what you guys are doing is really great because it's creating these communities that help you find other people that are doing similar things. Um, and so, yeah, so that's cool. Um, I think that answers the question. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so for, I mean, oh, no, I was just, just going to add for us, it's very similarly just network effects. We, we went from having our own established network 
to deciding to join 1909 because there were other entrepreneurs associated with it. Doing that, <laughs> I directly met people who could then introduce me to people at FAU Tech Runway, mm -hmm. uh, which helped us get into that program and be associated with other mentors who have now gotten us in touch with all these other companies. So every inter introduction we've ever had has all started with the fact that we joined 1909 initially. Um, so it's really just the, establishing your initial network and then leveraging your network to, to establish new connections. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's just about uh, surrounding yourself with like-minded people and something that, you know, is really nice here in South Florida, at least in our community is it seems like everybody's willing to help. Like they want to help. They want to connect you with the right people, the right resources, just because, you know, I feel like we see the potential in South Florida as a whole. And like I mentioned, like 909 has been such a great resource of connecting the community. Um, for those of you listening who don't know what 1909 is, it's a culture for creators. It's a co-working space and accelerator that unites um, the Palm Beaches and delivers talent and resources and mentors and the accelerator program and all that. So it's super cool. And even, even Tech Runway down in Boca, like when I was a part of the program, um, you know, even I had five mentors, but besides that, there's about 80 mentors in the program and you're able to go to a luncheon and pitch or not pitch them, but hear feedback. Like, what do you suggest? And, you know, a lot of times it's professionals from all types of industries, you know, retired entrepreneurs and even like sales directors and all of that. So I feel like, uh, from my perspective, since I work at Palm Beach Tech now, it's about really just attending and showing up to, to these virtual events right now, you know, and then just, you know, being super vulnerable, like, hey, like, like Matt, Matt, you know, you do a great job with get speed back. Like, hey, we're, we're a startup. You want to test this out and kind of just putting yourself out there. Um, but it I just had that exact experience. Sorry, Monica, not to cut you off, but I, I went to a Palm Beach Tech meeting virtual meeting two weeks ago i just happened to introduce myself when talking to someone after the meeting i got an email from this guy saying hey we're trying to figure out a better way to do this let's have a conversation and i kicked the whole thing off so absolutely just just being present being willing to say yes and go and participate is, is huge yeah and um even nick i know you i don't know if you feel comfortable but you can talk about a little bit more about the leadership program that you've created with bundle iq like I've attended a few of the meetings and it was just super cool to see how his platform actually helps all types of people. And not just that you're exposing me and the other people that attend to your platform. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. And thanks for opening up uh, the opportunity to do that. So back in March, when uh, I started to recognize that we were going into uh, quarantine uh, and things were you know, the, the, the foundation was starting to shift, so to speak. Uh, I decided to, to create a leadership meetup called Owning Your Leadership. And I did it first, first and foremost for myself because, I, you know, leadership is a personal journey. And I, I created a system of accountability for myself to show up every Thursday at noon and to, to create these exercises for myself um, and basically decided to open it up to every, you know, whoever wanted to join. If one person joined, great. If however many joined, you know, awesome, even better. And, uh, and I let, I use bundle IQ as like the, basically the knowledge base of, of all the exercises that I did and all the agendas that I created. And, um, and I, I, I tagged it as call notes. And so everyone that would join owning your leadership on Thursday at noon, I would give them access to the call notes so they could see previous call notes. And so now we're on, we're on week 12 of owning your leadership. And, and there's a lot of insights in, in the call notes now um, and exercises like building your personal mission statement as an example. So there's a, there's five steps exercise that you can go through uh, to build out your personal mission statement. Um, we talk a lot about team building because that's something that I'm actively doing is, is participating uh, in this kind of uh, conscious um, effort towards team building. And so there's a lot of notes inside of the call notes uh, surrounding that topic. Um, and it's been amazing. I mean, we've had 90 people join Owning Your Leadership so far in 12 weeks. And we have, 
at least 12 or 15 or so every single week that, that are actively participating and just multiple people cycling through. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a lot of fun, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has been. I really enjoy those, those calls. Um, you know, thanks for even hosting that. I feel like I've learned so much and you know, I got to know what your app does as well and how I can benefit from it. Um, but Gaida, you've been in the startup community a little bit longer. I mean, you guys were founded in, um, was it 2012? No, so the, the building side of our business, um, it's a long story, I'm gonna to try to make it short. It started in 2009. So 2009, there was a, a big market slump and um, my co-founder, um, who I'm married to, he um, actually lost his job and from that started his own thing. And it just started out as like, oh, I'm gonna consult, do stuff. Well, then that grew and grew and we realized how important making buildings better was. Um, and then we were also doing sustainability consulting on the organizational side. And so that side of the business wasn't really tech or a startup. It, it started just becoming a, you know, a really, Big consulting company but as part of that we realized that there's a lot of tech and tools needed in the industry right um and so that's where we really switch now to start to make it more of SaaS solutions combined with that because that's the way that it needs to go for it to be successful um and so that's that's what we're working on so so yeah i would say you know really the sustainable base you know today was more founded like in the last two years but yeah that's been going on for and um i guess I, I would say that you know nick was mentioning funding i don't know how many people out there are looking for funding um i think that south florida to be honest is a little bit more difficult probably to find funding in a way i think that there maybe are less um groups um you know we we've talked to a lot of them but there i think there's also a huge potential to find angels that are aligned with your goals and what you want to do. Um, so it's just a matter of that networking and like meeting people and connecting so that you can find people that are, you know, aligned with your values and what you're trying to accomplish um, and do that and get yourself um, to the next level. And, um, and I will throw out there that, you know, I think there's few investors in Florida from what I've seen that will invest if you're not really generating much revenue yet. Um, and I think that if you can get to the point where you're making maybe about a half a million or a little less in recurring revenue, you're gonna have like doors open for you everywhere, right? So I think like that's what I've seen. And I thought I'd share that with people depending on where you're at to kind of gauge the kind of person that you wanna be looking for. Are you currently fundraising right now? We were, we've pitched a lot of people um, and we, are at a point where we've decided we want to bootstrap it a little bit longer and try to find a couple of angels that are better aligned before we go to the next level. Um, for us, for many reasons, um, there's a lot of things that we want to get very uh, baked and aligned in the way that we want um, before we go for bigger funding. Um, and that's really important to us. Like we want it to be the kind of company that that it needs to be. Um, and so, yeah, so for now we're still uh, bootstrapping it, uh, but uh, we like it that way. And we actually made the conscious decision that for the next year, unless we find a couple of angels that are just the right people, um, that's what we're gonna do. And do you go through different organizations here, like, um, you know, Tech Runways Investor Network or uh, Miami Angels, have you tried any of those? Any of those? Yeah, out? we've we've talked to a lot of them. We've talked to New World Angels, uh, Florida Funders. You know, a lot of different amazing people. Like every conversation I've had, I've learned so much. Um, there's some really great sources of knowledge and funding out there. And I think the key is, you know, um, if you can pull it off, um, to put yourself in a position where the funding would be great to grow but you're not going to crash and burn without it, right? To be in a position where it's a nice to have and not a must have to survive. Um, because if you're in that position, you know, it's, there's a certain peace to that. There's a certain control to that. Um, and I think that you can have better conversations with people um, right, right. if you're there. And how long did it take you to get your pitch deck ready? I know that's a huge topic, especially oh. startups. 
I would oh, say okay. it's never ready. And I think, I think anybody that tells you that your pitch deck is done is, is wrong. <laughs> I think you, you get a version of your pitch deck and then you grow and you evolve and you learn and you switch something. And so, I mean, um, it's, uh, I don't know. And it kind of depends on, are you focusing on a pitch deck full time or are you also trying to run a business and focus on sales and growth and everything else, right? So I think yeah. it's different for everybody, but I will say that I don't think it's ever done. Um, <laughs> and I think if you think it's done, then you're probably not thinking about your business enough because it should evolve and it should change. Yeah. So, I mean, Matt, I know I know you you're working on your pitch deck um, Nick, I don't know if you have a pitch deck because I feel like you're a little bit farther along. Um, but I know when I was working on my pitch deck, I had to uh, change depending on the audience that I was pitching to. So if I was pitching to, let's just say Miami Angels, I'd have to pitch to their taste, you know, their investor network. And if I was pitching here in Boca Raton, it'd have to change. But you'd always ask the, you know, the managing partner for feedback or even, you know, reach out to those angels that are in the group. That are, that are a little bit more accessible and ask them, hey, like, what's the type of startups everyone's investing in? What gets them excited? Uh, Matt, did you end up finishing your pitch deck or did you, are you still working on that? No, good question. So, we, so we've done a bunch of different pitch decks already, more so for the application for those programs that we initially mentioned. Um, currently, we're actually bootstrapping the business with no plans to raise any money in the near future. Um, we believe that we can build the business sustainably um, in that fashion. So we're kind of excited to try that out and do so. However, though, I would I would add that, I mean, yes, you, you definitely want to adjust your pitch deck depending on your audience, which is exactly what we're doing right now in terms of selling. It's, it's adjusting your positioning to be as effective as you possibly can speaking to the exact person that, that you're talking to. So we do have decks uh, for presentation purposes, not necessarily uh, for, for selling, not necessarily for raising funds, but um, absolutely. And I'm curious what, what Nick would have to say on that front as well. Uh, obviously, he's, he's a little bit more active in terms of networking and, and finding people from a financing standpoint. Yeah, what I realized is that I should have been raising money earlier. Um, so we had a, a really significant growth curve in the first year uh, of Bundle IQ. Um, and that would have been the perfect time to raise money. Um, it's since kind of gone like plateau and then like creeping up again. Um, so just be mindful of the data. Uh, if you're starting to see that kind of stuff, um, like 30% month over month or 40% month over month and, and, and you're starting to get revenue. Um, so if you like, for instance, if I would have raised when I, you know, when we had revenue at, a certain MRR, which was like 5,000 a month. And we had the growth that would have been the perfect time to raise. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, but, uh, but now we, we missed that boat. So now we're on to, you know, having to, to get like 10, 10 to 15,000 MRR, um, before we can kind of have any sort of significant, um, investor like to get into like a syndicate on angel angel list or anything like that so i don't know if that helps but yeah so you know what i mean that did that did help and it's it's cool because i like i mentioned before you guys are all on different points of your startup journey so you guys have different perspectives and uh can give great feedback but let's you know what let's talk about this exciting topic that we're here for um your lessons learned i would love to hear some of you guys' lessons learned and hopefully this can help people and avoid them going through the same thing <laughs> um i guess i'll say one yeah it's a, a big one for me has been balancing my gut and what I think is going on in the marketplace with market research and with advice, right? Because I think when you're trying to create something relatively new, like you have a vision and you see what's wrong in the marketplace and you think everybody needs this, right? 
Um, and you might do market research that tells you, you know, yes, these pieces might be right and these pieces might not be right. And that market research might be limited or not, right? Or you may have no market research. I don't know, you might just talk to people. Um, and then you might, as you grow, start to get a bunch of different mentors and people that don't know your business as well, but they will give you a lot of thoughts and advice. And you have to become like in my, I used to take it all in and be really stressed about it. Um, meaning that like, I felt like they're right. Oh no, they're right. And this is, and we need to shut this down, you know? And I think over time you need to, as an entrepreneur, become like a very calm filter. Like you need to take it all in and like make sense of it and then be comfortable with making your own decisions about, you know what, I heard that, but no, like this is where I feel like it needs to go. And not just, I say the word feel, it's not feel like you're looking at data and you're looking at things, but, but you need to be able to filter a lot and be able to be comfortable with like, this is the course that we're gonna take. And, and you know, that's one piece of advice that don't get overwhelmed by everything. I like take it all in, go find it, get as many perspectives as you can, but then step back and just refocus like with that information and be good with that and make those choices. I mean, I can, I can certainly, uh, I, I definitely feel the same way. I mean, in, in terms of what we're doing right now, it's, it's the people who we're talking to asking for features or saying, oh, you guys should do this or that. And it's having the resolve to say, you know, okay, we're trying to get your business, but at the same time, adding these things immediately is, is, is going to be detrimental to what we're doing and may not be needed by the whole that we're going after. So I definitely feel the same way. I think my, I, I wrote one down quickly previously, which was, um, I guess, more fundamental, which is looking for a problem rather than a solution. So um, you know, I know I myself have, you know, wanted to start, a, to start businesses previously. And, and I think of, oh, wow, this thing is really awesome. It's really great. Um, but, it, and it gets to your point guide of like, you don't know if, if the problem is there or not necessarily, you're going off your own vision. And so my, my lesson would be certainly look for a problem to solve rather than coming up with an interesting solution to start off with. And if you find a problem and the problem is big enough and people have it frequently enough, then it's something that's certainly worth solving with whatever solution you can come up with. Yeah, um, I would say charge um, sooner rather than later for your services. Um, so one of the things that I heard Matt say is that he's almost got one of his first customers. And so uh, definitely keep keeping in keeping in line with that uh, as a way of being, I think is really important. So, I mean, yeah, Nick, I was going to say that, sorry, <laughs> I am. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, giving things away for free. I mean, there are, there is that business model. It, it's worked for some people, but I think if, especially if you're bootstrapping a startup, what I've seen, at least in our experience, is that when you charge people a reasonable value for what you're giving, which is a value, it's respected and it's more likely to be renewed and used, right? Because there's a value to it. So I agree with that, Nick. And also from, a, you know, making sure your company, you know, you're, you're in business for, for business. And I, I agree with the finding the market, charging money and being profitable. Um, I think that it's a business, right? So even if you're doing great social goods and you're doing good things for the world, um, after all, if you can't stay profitable and you can't make money off of it, then you're not going to stay in business and you're not going to be able to do any of it. So that's number one. So regrettably, we probably all spend way too much time looking at spreadsheets and things like that, but that's what it's all about, you know? Because otherwise you can't keep going. You can't pay your employees. You can't help people. I guess another lesson, oh, sorry, that was me. I guess another lesson to add um, from, from that point was um, like uh, our standpoint was we, we needed to have the confidence to start charging for our product. So we had just built our platform. We're continuing to iterate on it all the time. But how do you go from the mindset of like, oh, it's just a couple of guys building something <laughs> to getting companies to, to be willing to test with us and then to get companies willing to give you money for it. So 
at some point we had to make the mental transition and this happened very recently of no we're you know good enough we're big enough we offer value that people should be paying for and so now we're going to ask for money rather than ask for you just to use our product for free so um i guess another lesson is just be confident in who you are and what you've built and um you know uh, t- take the mindset of you're you're bigger than you are and the people you're talking to don't don't know anything about your your background yeah i mean how, how did you guys get your first customers i think that's like the hardest part about having a startup is like again like yeah having the confidence but like what go to market strategy strategy did you guys have or would you guys recommend for early startups I was going to let Nick go, but I'll go. Um, so for, we're a little different because since we started as a, as a consulting firm, we had consulting customers that then were interested in what we, what we learned from them. And then they were interested in what we were building. And so we kind of got some initial paying customers that way. Right. Because it's like, Hey, we're already helping you with this. We built this, you know, and then it just became part of our, of our contract. Um, it is um, not an easy thing then to figure out, you know, because we're a shifting model, you know, what what's the right way to go from here, right? And so we've gotten customers for us everywhere from responding to an RFP to converting an existing customer that wasn't tech to tech um, and to go out and going out there and making like a cold sale, right? But um, uh, but we are still in the process, and I think we always are, of refining, you know, the right way to continue to roll our products out um, and, the, you know, the right way to, to land customers in the future. Right. Yeah, so for us at Bundle IQ, we leaned heavily on building beta and building customers into beta. Uh, and that's, you know, basically the, the strategy that we've taken and continue to take. Um, we kind of failed at our first business model at our first pass. Um, we had hundreds of customers, but it wasn't scaling the way that we wanted it to. It was almost like we were charging too much money. And so we sort of had to like figure something new out. And then, um, to guide his point about taking someone's advice, I, I was out in Silicon Valley and I pitched this guy, Jason Calacanis, who's a, a pretty well-known angel investor. And, and he was like, okay, look, everything you're doing over there, like stop doing that and focus on this. And it was like slide three of my pitch deck. And he said, cause if you had that, I would pay for that. And I'd pay you a lot of money for that. And so that was like what we were working on is like this going kind of deep on this intelligence level of helping enhance human, the human's ability to make sense of information. And that's where, you know, we're going to be charging, you know, a lot more money. Um, and it's totally scalable. So, yeah. And from my, from my perspective, um, I got, I, he- I heard some great advice that really stuck with me as a startup founder, like one of your first customers, they should be your friend. You know, they should have your number. Like they are like, they could be everything for you because they could be the one recommending you. And if you give them the best customer experience and the, you know, they end up calling you bro or, you know, they're your homie, then they're definitely going to be, you know, they could bring so much value and become a long-term customer. And um, that's definitely some of the best advice I've heard because, I, you know, as a customer, you always want to be really professional. But yeah, professional in a business sense, but then um, friendly in a way where it's like they know they can count on you. And, you know, it just shows that you're really hungry and want to give them, want to be the best. So um, that's just an advice. That's advice that stuck with me from, you know, for months, for months out. But we actually have a question um, from Farouk. He said, did you try to validate your idea before building an MVP? Um, ours, yes, because we basically, our customers told us this is what we want. And we had the situation also, thankfully, um, there was a, a government cus- customer that had an RFP and uh, we were able to pitch the, um, the product um, in that way. And we won over like some other big companies, right? So, so that validated 
at least for that one customer, right? And then, but what we we realized just based on market industry and talking to people that that yes, the need was there. Um, it's hard though because you don't have, um, you know, you you probably don't have a lot of funding and a lot of people, and so your market research is limited. But I think it's really important to do it as much as you can and to try to figure out what is it that they really want and or what is it about solutions that are adjacent or similar to yours that they're using that they don't like that you could fix and do better right um so that's really crucial i i added it in the chat oh sorry if my audio is bad i added in the chat there um that we we also did as i as i mentioned we spoke with a lot of local companies um before we started building anything out and i just wanted to add also that um, <clears throat> we started off just <laughs> conducting interviews, asking questions we thought were the right questions, and they're not the right questions. You really need to understand how to question these people to dig into what their fundamental issues are. And that's something that we learned was, um, you know, just asking, oh, uh, you know, what do you think of this? Or, or if we did this, w would this be good for you? And these are like leading questions. They're not helpful to you although they sound good and so you really need to dig as deep as possible and to that point i would recommend the book the mom test and talking to humans those two books actually that are all about conducting useful um, interviews of prospective customers and very quick reads that can just transform these sorts of conversations you're having and making sure that when you're actually starting to build the mvp you're building something that gets to the core problem rather than just going off the idea that you initially had. And we actually have another question from Nikki. Um, as a startup with limited access to funding and tools, how do you currently measure your success? What are your, what metrics do you guys use? At Bundle IQ, we, we measure uh, time spent, we measure how many new users come on and what their retention is of those users. Um, those are the kind of the primary metrics. And then, um, yeah, I mean, re re revenue was like a 2019 thing uh, as of January 1st. We don't, we haven't had revenue since then. So um, we'll be, you know, obviously measuring that as soon as, as soon as that's available to us again. I was muted. Um, yeah, revenue is big, right? So profitability, revenue, um, measuring those constantly. Um, and uh, now we're trying to get more sophisticated and to start measuring more about, you know, how how they're using the tool and how often and why and et cetera. And um, so we have a lot of work to do on that front. Um, I'm I'm personally very KPI driven. Um, I like to track things a lot, you know, quarterly, monthly or so and revisit. Um, and that's one area that I wanna do a lot better in lately. Um, so other than like the hard, like revenue numbers, I think I need to start with the team creating more um, user usability type numbers as well. From, from our standpoint, we're fairly limited in the metrics we're measuring right now, although um, it's, it's obvious that they're different depending on the different types of businesses. Very soon, we'll, be, we'll start to track things more so than how many meetings we have on the schedule and how well the meetings are going. But um, it just, just to add in future, something to be mindful of is um, you know, vanity metrics, making sure that you're measuring the right things. Don't get caught up with how many people you're signing up um, or how many emails you've collected, you really want to get to how many people are using your product, sticking with your product, or using your platform. Um, th th those two, two differences. Okay, and honestly, I think <sighs> that we need to cover is um, building your team, like the startup team, like what pieces do you guys need, you know, to get everything off the ground? Like, is it obviously a tech uh, co-founder is uh, convenient for all of us, but Besides that, what do you guys 
like what's what team members are a must so for us uh, i've been focused on building our moat which is like the tech making bundle iq technologically defensible so that people can't go out and just recreate it um, even if they have the money to do so and so a lot of that uh, moat building so to speak has been with our machine learning architect and our um, kind of chief engineer um, on the back end. So we've been really focused on making these kind of one to two week iterations on making our AI smarter um, to, to really start to connect, uh, connect the dots on, on all the thoughts that people are, are creating and, and sharing in the database that they, they have on Bundle IQ. Um, so that's been like the, the core of our team. And then I, I just brought on a, a full stack developer. Uh, he starts on July 1st. So um, there's been that. And then also with the fundraising in mind, um, building out diversity on our, our board of advisors and making sure that, um, you know, we have uh, proper kind of representation on the board to, you know, get diversity of thought. And um, it's been a lot of fun doing that too. It's been cool. Um, okay, so I guess um, as to team, you know, uh, we weren't kind of weren't technical co-founders. So because uh, my background is law and MBA type things. So from that respect, I'm technical. Um, other co-founder is very technical when it comes to science and climate science and building science. Um, but we didn't until the beginning of this year have a full time lead developer. Um, like a uh, backend database. And so we started out with, um, we started out with um, somebody that was really smart and uh, kind of was the first, the third person in the team. And he wasn't a developer, but he was so smart that he was really interested in what we were doing. He kind of figured it out and built out the first iteration. And from there, it kind of outgrew his skill set and we had to find the right team. And so you try to balance like using an outside team, which has its drawbacks and its benefits with at what point do you bring people in full time and they become truly a part of the team. Um, and I, you know, I think we've struggled with that. I think it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, um, I'm really happy with, you know, Isaac, who just joined us full time in January. He's amazing. Um, and so we really enjoyed um, having him on and, uh, you know, just keep going. And then for things that you need, you know, we can't, we can't hire everyone we need. So we have to make sure we budget enough to hire the right people to do the pieces that Isaac can't do on his own or that we can't do on our own, right? And, and balance it out and, and find good people, you know, like people that you work well with. Um, we've worked with, um, I think, especially with, with developers, sometimes you can find somebody that's very skilled at what they do, but if it's difficult to communicate and to, um, you know, accomplish a task, then that doesn't matter, right? Because you, you can't have that rapport to like work in it. And when you're, when you're small, you know, things move quickly and you need to be able to be agile and adapt and have that communication. And so finding that good personality fit, I think is, is so important in addition to the skill set. Yeah, we, we were having this discussion as, as part of the 1909 Accelerator actually last week, and someone was looking for um, a technical co-founder and he was sort of strapped for time because he was trying to raise money and there were some, some other factors at play. And we got into this discussion of like technical ability versus relationship. And I couldn't agree more about having to have a really amazing relationship. And th this person in the accelerator was, he was really torn because he, you know, he, he thought he could um, find someone with a technical ability just to help them build something really quickly. And then they can work on the relationship after the fact. And a lot of us were on this other, in this other camp that was like, if you don't have a relationship, it's not even worth starting off in the first place. So um, I definitely agree. Relationship is, is, is massive, especially if you're coming in from a, a co-founding standpoint, as opposed to just a working standpoint. Um, but, but I mean, think about your team culture and what you want it to be like now. And if you happen to be successful, what you're aiming for, you're going to want really good relationships because you're spending so much time with these people. Um, for us, I've, I've been lucky enough to have Mihai, as I mentioned, as a technical co-founder. 
I'm, I'm more the all, all the other stuff sort of, di- sort of guy, you know, uh, filling in the other gaps similarly. But, you know, we don't, we don't have the ability to hire anyone right now because we're bootstrapping. We're not paying ourselves at this point. Um, so what we're doing is we're filling in our knowledge gaps with, uh, you know, reading, <laughs> uh, you know, finding as much content as we can about stuff that we think we need to know, as well as leveraging mentors. We're, you know, we were uh, lucky enough to get into the FAU Tech Runway program, which immediately gets us a nice set of mentors assigned to us. But otherwise, we've been just meeting with people and trying to get our own mentors on the side because there's nothing better than having people who have already been through this process who can tell us what we need to be doing. So while I have no background in sales whatsoever, we've sort of learned by finding a guy who is, you know, a, a sales freak and then just having him tell us all the stuff that we need to try to be doing. So we're, we're a little bit smaller than, than you other two. And that's sort of how we've been trying to get things up and running it from our standpoint. Yeah. And Guy made a great point. Personality fit is huge. Um, and just, you know, as a startup, you, you don't have the resources, like you mentioned, Matt, at the beginning. So you have to find that person who's willing to sacrifice because it's, you know, the founders aren't the only ones sacrificing. It's the whole team because they, they know their value and you just have to try to motivate them and keep them happy. And it's, I feel like at first you're, kind, you're always on edge, like, can I trust this person? Are they just going to leave, come back? So um, a lesson I learned was definitely sign an agreement at the beginning, you know, the equity and how it can go from one point to another and um, just making sure everyone feels value. So I feel like it's, it's definitely a competitive startup world out there when it comes to finding talent. But I'm glad that, you know, we can all agree that there are people out there. Um, it takes some time, but you know, you, you end up figuring out mentors are huge. Mentors are basically some of the best resources, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think you guys made some great points and we just have one more question from Eric. Um, how has working more remotely helped and hurt build, building your companies? From a, from a meta standpoint in that we are a future of work software. Uh, once COVID hit, our numbers like spiked because, um, well, for many reasons, but uh, but distributed workers, uh, you know, and knowledge management go hand in hand. So um, that was really exciting to see and, and super timely. Um, as far as uh, like how our workflow. Um, kind of looks at bundle IQ is, is kind of at the core of it. So we get to eat our own dog food, which has been a lot of fun too. Um, so I've just had fun with it. I mean, <laughs> I think it's really exciting remote work. Um, I've been working remotely since 2010 full time. And I even lived in my van for, for four months and drove around the country. And even that alone was like so much fun and I, I kind of had to have like a, a Verizon card and another computer because they were not compatible with Macs at the time so I'm, I'm like the OG remote worker in the town I guess that's awesome Nick <laughs> um, so we always wanted to have a remote workforce since we've started. Um, I think that that has helped us um, get really good people and also create incentives for joining beyond money. Um, you know, I think that, well, it's there's tons of studies about this. Yes, people want a good salary, but when you pair that with, you know, flexible paid time off and work wherever you want, and we're all about efficiency and getting things done and being sustainable and efficient, right? So you can work that way too, right? And I think that means a lot to people. And I think that has helped us build a good team with the right values. And, you know, it's all about let's get things done the best way possible and make our customers happy. And it's not about clocking in 14 hour days. In fact, if you can clock a lot of less hours and get the same stuff done, please do it because that makes us a better company, right? So let's, so that's, what we've always been about. So when COVID hit, um, did not affect our work style at all. We, you know, we have all our processes online. We use all kinds of different tools to do it. And so, um, so that was fine. 
I will say, you know, we have, um, we have someone that goes out in, in the field and um, building has been an essential business. And so it didn't get shut down. And, you know, we did hear that he might've gotten COVID um, actually. And so it's, it's scary and it's now affecting our team directly. And um, we're worried about him and we're going to hope for the best. Right. But when you have a small team, that kind of a thing really, really affects you. And so, yeah, it's affected us in that, in that way now. Um, but, um, but thankfully not from a workflow standpoint. Uh, for us, we haven't been affected personally as much just because we're a small team, but uh, it has affected the businesses that we're talking to. So our initial thought was, let's focus on local South Florida businesses. We can go into their offices. We can have meetings and present ourselves. And that changed very quickly. And uh, we also learned that as these businesses were um, transitioning to distributed or remote work environments, that they close themselves off mentally in terms of we don't want to take on anything new or we're afraid to spend any money right now. And so that was an obstacle we had to overcome. And we, we sort of looked at it as an opportunity. So we mentally pivoted a bit um, more so like Nick in terms of the future of work software. So we, what we were building already was meant to help teams um, be faster and more agile. And so if we just change the way we spoke about things, um, you know, aiming towards remote teams or saying, well, you'll have a better idea of how people are doing um, now that you're remote uh, was certainly helpful for us. So I think my, my mentality is if we're able to speak with companies now and get sales now, then things will be really great once we get to a time of new normalcy or more relaxed thought processes in terms of these businesses. So it's definitely changed the way we, we've had to go talking to people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was going to say like same thing. It's a really good point. I think that the companies and the governments we're talking to, it, it is a much more cautious time. You know, they're, they're, um, because we're making, you know, um, uh, b2b kind of enterprise type sales you know it, it there's uh, more budget considerations um more caution when they're going into the discussions um but the good thing for you matt too it's like you're you you know you're saying you're learning about sales and stuff you you, you get a great time to practice I and mean, you're right and like hopefully once things get better and you're great at it then you go you know with the bigger things so yeah it's, it's a good for us too there's certain things that are new in our business that we're working on and it's been an interesting time to test them out and kind of talk to people more casually from a learning perspective than like a hard sales perspective that's been cool yeah all right well i mean it's time if you guys want to add any more comments or resources that has helped you this is you know your final chance um Anyone want to add anything that we haven't covered or any last minute tips? We're good. Um, I'll, I'll open up uh, just an opportunity. I'm going to drop my email into to the chat. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I've got like a 15 minute kind of calendar invite thing that we can schedule a call if anyone wanted to chat. Um, here's my email. I'm going to include that on Sorry. Facebook as well and uh, LinkedIn for all of them listening. There we go. Cool. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you all for having us. And same here. Feel free to reach out. Yeah, and we, and we have a startup founders peer group at Palm Beach Tech, and we're looking to get more involved with it in August. So I'll keep you guys updated. And, you know, it's just going to be like a resource hub, you know, put in tips, tricks, or are we having a bad day? It's, it's just going to be part of our community. So um, we'll be in touch guys. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Have a great day, guys. You too. Yeah. Thanks for having Appreciate us. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thanks. Nice job. Bye. Thank you.